Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Namaste so from the comments I've been getting and other feedback from different people, it seems that nobody has really understood the four levels of consciousness, four states of consciousness, I should say. Even though I've been talking about it for literally years, it seems, I don't know, anyone who, who can uh, reflect the original understanding of this. And basically, it comes from Mandukya Upanishad, where it says the Brahman is divided into four quarters. What does it mean by four quarters? Four states of consciousness. Brahman is all consciousness. And then it's divided into four quarters, which means that the original Brahman, which is only pure, unobjective, or objectless self-awareness is reflected in the other three states of consciousness, which are jagrat, or external consciousness of the world, svapna, or internal dream consciousness, and sushupti, deep sleep. It's critical to understand that, especially in the waking state, all the different forms of consciousness are available and active all the time. For example, Jagrat consciousness means being aware of the world through the senses. And when we're in Jagrat, or focused on, I should say, when our attention is focused on Jagrat consciousness, we think the world is real. We think that we are the body. We think that God is somewhere far away in another world. <laughs> and we think that we are the actors, the doers, that cause and effect is in operation and actions produce consequences either through karma or through mechanical interaction with the world. We think that uh, we are free agents, we have free will, <laughs> and we decide things and we know things independently, and so on. Now, when we go into svapna, or dream consciousness, all this goes away. And we find ourselves in a different world where the rules are different, where things don't go according to the physical laws of the external universe. But we're still in a world, and it's still full of objects, and we still have all kinds of feelings about them and so on. But our actions are not under our control. Uh, unless you develop lucid dreaming as a practice, you're simply swept along with whatever happens in the dream. And so even though uh, you may have feelings and reactions, those feelings and reactions are kind of part of the whole dream illusion. Why is it an illusion? Because it's temporary. When we wake up in the morning, dream is gone, and we can never recapture it again. So in this state, we don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> it just happens to us. We're not doers. We're simply experiencers, being swept along in the flow of the mind's uh, processing of previous impressions, basically. 
And then in Sushupti, everything goes away. And we are not even a perceiver because there's nothing to perceive. Now, when we enter Swapna with awareness, this is called concentration. This is the realm of bhakti, the realm of mantra, the realm of the subtle worlds, manomaya huh? and vijnana moya of the five sheaths. And uh, I guess we could include pranamoya because that's also part of the subtle body. But basically, in dream consciousness, in bhakti, we imagine a form of God, which is basically a metaphor or a symbol for Brahman, and which reflects some of the qualities derived from Brahman. Even though Brahman itself has no qualities, we imagine that the world needs a creator, and so that creator is a god, and we approach that god and render service, and then we get uh, various benefits and boons in response. So this is the world of religion. This is the world <clears throat> of bhakti yoga. Higher than this is when we enter into sushupti consciousness with awareness. This is called meditation or samadhi. And in samadhi, we know that there is no world, that the world is just a dream, an illusion, and that there is no doer and there is no action. There really is no movement, change, birth, death, and so on. We may not have realized it fully, but we know this. This is the beginning of jnana. Jnana means knowledge based on the Upanishads and Vedas. That this world is an illusion. From the point of view of sushupti, of meditation, the world doesn't exist. Just like when we go into sushupti when we're asleep, the world doesn't exist, nothing exists. <laughs> so this is a valid state, this is a valid point of view. And then finally there's Turiya, when we attain complete self-realization, Brahman. And in Turiya, the world is unborn, that's why it's called Ajatavada. The view that the world is unborn. It never was. It never came into existence in the first place, so it can't go out of existence either. A huh? famous example of the rope and the snake. Once you know that it's not a snake, it's a rope, the snake disappears forever. And it never was. It was only the misperception or misapprehension of the rope that caused the snake to appear to exist. And it's the same with the world. Because every night when we go to sleep, the world disappears. That wouldn't happen if it was real. If it was real, the world would be there all the time. Now, this Ajatavada, this Turiya, is pure self-awareness. This is the substrate. This is the foundation for the other states of consciousness. So we find that Brahman is pure being, unconditioned being. And Brahman consciousness, Turiya, is similarly unconditioned consciousness, unlimited without any ignorance whatsoever, no boundaries, no objects. So then when we go into Sushupti and Svapna and Jagrat consciousness, that awareness is conditioned 
That's why I say it's reflected as described in the Drik Drishya Vivekaha, which we did a whole series on. There is no real consciousness in the body or the senses or the mind. It's only reflected consciousness from the Brahman. So try to understand. These four states of consciousness are always active. They're always available. And it's just a question of where we focus our attention and from what point of view we view the world and reality. And when I say that someone is in uh, this state of consciousness or that state, you know, Jagwara or Swapna or Sushupti or whatever, what that means is that their focus or their identification or their point of view is in that state of consciousness. So what they see is going to be different depending on what state they're in. Now, I hope this is clear. In other words, it's not like there are clear-cut boundaries between these different states of consciousness. It's not that um, once one attains, um, let's say, meditation or even enlightenment, that the other states of consciousness just go away. No, they're still available. They're still functional. But the center of gravity of one's awareness changes. So that, for example, a person who is completely conditioned is more or less stuck in Jagrat. The point of view of Jagrat, Dvaitavada, the dualistic point of view, they're stuck there. They can't get out of it. But a person who has higher states of consciousness, Svapna and Sushupti, developed through bhakti and meditation, respectively, has the option to move their focus, to move the center of gravity of their consciousness to a different state. That doesn't mean that the other states go away. No, they're still there. They're still available. And especially to one who is enlightened, they are the master of these states of consciousness and can move at will between them. So the confusion arises, I think, from the fact that the different views, the Dvaitavada view, which is associated with Jagrat consciousness, the Vishishta Dvaita view associated with Swapna consciousness, the Vishishta view, Vishishtavada view, associated with Sushupti consciousness and the Ajatavada view uh, associated with Turiya are very different from one another. What you see, uh, how you respond to the reality and so on, how you relate to everything is different, very different in these different states of consciousness. And of course, dealing with individuals who are in a different state of consciousness from ours is a, a challenge for people in the lower states. They can't imagine what it's like to be in sushupti with awareness, even though they experience sushupti every night when they go to sleep. <laughs> That's why it's said, see, from the point of view of someone who has realized Brahman, that everything and everyone is Brahman and everyone is enlightened because they have all four states of consciousness, you see. But in the unenlightened person, the consciousness is not under their control. It just happens to them as they go through the day. They oscillate between Jagrat and Svapna, for example, when they're thinking or when they're daydreaming. They're actually in Svapna consciousness. But if they think that the world and the reality is Dvaitav, 
uh, duality, and Jagrat is their center, they will have a whole different set of values, a whole different point of view than someone who has developed the meditative states in Svapna or Sushupti, what to speak of Turiya. So I hope this makes things a little clearer. Uh, if these are still confusing to you, please post in the comments so that I can make more videos that address your specific concerns or confusions about this teaching, because this teaching is the fundamental foundation of everything. And it's given in the Mandukya Upanishad, it's also given in other Upanishads, principally in, in the Upanishads, uh, which deal with consciousness and enlightenment. So uh, this is the, the rock, <laughs> the, the bedrock on which the whole Vedic system is established. And this is actually the, uh, the main clue that leads to a perfect enlightenment and liberation. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.